Wait. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for attending this webinar on managing the risk of returning staff to work in the COVID-19 environment. My name's Megan, and I'm one of the Workplace Relations Advisors within the Jobs Australia Workplace Relations team. This webinar is scheduled to run for around 45 minutes, and if you have any questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to pop them into the chat box. And if there's time at the end of the session, I'll answer some of the questions, but if not, I will follow them up after the webinar. So let's start. So before we go any further, I just want to give a quick disclaimer that the information provided um, is on COVID-19 and industrial relations. It doesn't negate any information that should be sought from a healthcare professional. The information provided is given in a general sense and should not be taken as legal advice. And the information that we're giving today, it branches out to Australia as a whole, given that we are an Australian wide base membership and each state does have their own restrictions in place. So the main changes we've seen with COVID-19 and industrial relations is uh, the shutdown and restrictions placed on industry. So many organisations have had to adapt to having social distancing requirements within the workplace, which has been tricky when we're dealing with our client base work, such as our disability sector. And there's also been a, re a general reduction of work due to COVID. Because of that, we've seen the creation of the JobKeeper package. It has assisted our organisations to manage their staff levels, give leave and change any hours of work. It's also assisted in the reduction of the wage bill to the organisation for those employees, and it's allowed them to maintain their current staffing levels. However, it has given us some issues with staff not wanting to return to the workplace and receive the $1,500 per fortnight as a minimum. With a large uh, workforce that have been either working from home, a mix of working from in the office, um, and working from home. We've seen a lot of our organisations uh, need to quickly adapt to the change by implementing policies from working from home at a short notice. And these had to include things such as occupational health and safety of employees while working from home and the technological requirements that you need to give them for them to undertake their role. There's also been a lot of questions raised by what is the organisation's requirement uh, to give employees for them to undertake their role from home. And there's also been a lot of issues raised by employers about how to do things such as performance management and manage staff productivity during a working from home process. And because of COVID, we have seen an increase to personal leave, whether it be staff being required to quarantine self-isolate or they have in fact contracted COVID themselves. There's also been staff anxiety about COVID and not wanting to be in the workplace in general due to outbreaks. We're having to deal with vulnerable staff in the workplace and we've seen organisations being on the forefront and creating their own paid pandemic leave. With the closures of schools and other situations, we've also seen uh, the increase to carers leave where people are required to look after their children. Before the amendments made to the award, the Fair Work Act didn't actually give any form of provision for a pandemic. So we we're flying quite blind when it came to advice we could give to organisations of what they can and can't do due to COVID. So we have seen two major amendments made to our modern awards and that is the 10 days of unpaid pandemic leave where an employee is required by government um, or medical authority um, not to uh, attend work or to self-isolate. And this can also come from a medical practitioner's requirement of a staff member 
for them to self-isolate. So outside the general government restriction. We've also seen the ability of employees uh, able to take annual leave at half pay. And because of the, the stoppage and the shutdown of industry, we've also seen an increase in restructures and redundancies. But overall, there has been uh, an increase to stress um, and anxiety within the workplace, especially for our employers dealing with this time of the year. A lot of our non-for-profit sectors are going through uh, budgets, um, dealing with outbreaks or working with vulnerable people, which has led to a lot of questions and also for employees dealing with that anxiety about COVID in the workplace and job security. So JobKeeper has been around, there's been amendments made to it, but I'm not gonna go through that today. What the reason why I put JobKeeper in there is because it's important to note for our organisations that do have access to JobKeeper, there is ability for you to manage your staff if you are in receipt of it. So you have the ability to reduce staff, make your staff work from home, make your staff work on different days from a different work location. Uh, and that also gives you the ability to direct staff onto annual leave and importantly, direct staff to return back to work when the organisation requires it. So that's something called the JobKeeper Enabled Stand Down Directions, which is a long word, um, but that does encompass our three main points, reduced days of hours of work, changing duties and locations of work. That can also mean from home and requesting employees to take annual leave. So when we're giving those directives, there's still the requirement for us to give the three days notice in writing to these employees and the employees uh, must not unreasonably reject the directive of the employer. So we've had a lot of frequently asked questions about JobKeeper. And so I've just listed a couple of those, but the main rule or to apply is that if you've got an eligible employee in receipt of the $1,500, they would continue to receive it unless um, they are on um, the paid parental scheme offered by the Australian government, um, or they're not eligible for JobKeeper in the first place, or uh, there can be complexities around uh, work cover. The other question we've had is that, do employees um, still accrue their leave as per normal during JobKeeper? And the answer is yes, they still accrue their leave as per usual. So to start the main topic, we're looking today at a COVID safe workplace and what that really does look like. So bear in mind, each organisation would need to review their individual restrictions that are in place in regards to their state. Obviously, Victoria has something different to Western Australia, but they're all imperative on how you're going to maintain and operate the COVID safe workplace. So a couple of things that have arisen recently uh, before I drafted the presentation is now there'll be a requirement um, of employees in Victoria to wear face masks as, uh, as of tomorrow. The government hasn't been forthcoming with any further uh, exceptions to that, except for teachers in front of their students. But the main premise of that is where social distancing cannot be maintained. So when we're creating COVID safe workplace, it's really a main point of doing a risk assessment. Now, when you think risk assessment, I like to think of our health and safety reps. Now, if we don't have them in our workplace, now's a great time to look at electing them and getting them to work with you. Because when we're doing um, risk assessments in the workplace, if we do have our health and safety reps there, we must consult with them when we're looking to implement any change that Im may impact on the health and safety of our employees. Obviously, another important thing is that it's gonna be forever moving. We could see situations where we're returning our staff back to work for a week later to have to send them back home, to isolate them, to shut down, um, to clean the entire work, safe, uh, work environment because there's been an outbreak. So 
it's forever moving, which is why it's important for us to get our policies um, in place. So we've got occupational health and safety of the workplace policy. We've got COVID policies that can be adapted, but the most important is we need to have that COVID safe workplace um, policy implemented. Now, all of this information is provided by the Australian government. At the last slide, I have provided the links to that information. So what is the requirement set by the government for a COVID safe workplace? So that talks about your cleaning requirements, vulnerable employees and what that looks like. And it includes a number of handy checklists that are easy to read for our organisations to make sure that they are maintaining that requirement. The other place for information is Safe Work Australia. It's a fantastic resource um, which encompasses all of our occupational health and safety Australia wide. And with that, there is the ability to even search uh, industry specific information in regards to providing a COVID safe workplace and lots of handy FAQs available. So when we're looking at the requirement on the employer, we need to look at the responsibilities of the employer. So the responsibilities are governed under each state's own occupational work work health and safety legislation and that sets out the roles of the employer. So basically they must provide and maintain a workplace that is without risk to health and safety and that would be the same wording uh, across Australia. It's, it's quite um, the same across the board when it comes to the requirements of the employer. So that also means providing adequate um, facilities. That can also include PPE uh, when we're talking about COVID um, and monitoring health and wellbeing of your staff, not just in the work site, but also if they're working from home. So when we're looking at a COVID safe workplace strategy, there's, a, there's six steps that we should be looking at. So, Step number one is we've got staff working from home. Now, not every job, not every organisation can allow for that role to be done from home, but there's a number of information that has been given by the Australian government um, that where an employee can work from home, they should work from home. Obviously, every state is completely different. Some states will have the instruction that staff should be returned back to the work site um, now. So that's why I say it's important to look at our individual uh, states. But occupational health and safety at for your staff working at home has to include things such as what is their ergonomic setup with their workstation, um, even to uh, egress and excess of um, pathways, uh, right up to, I, I think I recall seeing the risk checklist to having uh, fire blankets and, um, and, and firefighting equipment, which is interesting and not necessarily easy to adapt um, at home. So the other thing is uh, having your work plans setting out your requirement to your staff of what you are requiring them to undertake. Uh, regular check-ins should be mandatory with your staff, not just about performance, but seeing how they're coping. A lot of our organisations are dealing with staff that are working in a basis where they are working in isolation, or they may not have anyone around them uh, during this time. So checking in and supporting them through the process, which is important to have your employee assistance programs available to any staff that aren't uh, coping with any working from home processes. The other issue is technology. Uh, that's something that uh, can be a bugbear for organisations about how, how to roll it out, how to provide it. But I've found that a number of our organisations have moved quickly in regards to implementing uh, technology. But there's certain things an employer does not have to provide to an employee that's working from home. So, you know, drawing the lines of having to provide your staff 
tea bags or um, office equipment. Um, there, there is certainly a line when it comes to that. But the main thing is that we're doing our regular check-ins with our staff to make sure that they're coping well. So when we're looking at returning back to the physical work site, the main thing that needs to be maintained is the physical distancing. So that's one person per four square metres, which means the 1.5 distance um, is required to be maintained. So if we look at a workplace and now this this uh, the social the physical distancing is not always possible. So if we're looking at uh, industries such as uh, disability healthcare, um, 1.5 metres distance um, for our support workers to undertake their role can't always be complied with. So then we need to look at additional things such as your PPE. Um, so when we're looking at a physical work location, we need to look at are our workstations spread out, um, you know, with the 1.5, is there enough meterage for um, the organisations to be compliant with the, with the physical distancing, looking at other areas such as, um, you know, your common areas, your meal rooms, uh, break rooms, how do they look like? What's the size size of that? Also, uh, hot desking is being a hot topic. Um, the Australian government has said there should be no hot desking during COVID um, or in a COVID safe workplace. So it's that consistency of cleaning um, and having that one safe at uh, one place that employee can work, which is not always possible. So if physical distancing or maintaining the 1.5 metres in your physical work location isn't an ability for the organisation. There's different mechanisms you can look at putting in place to maintain that. So whether we have a staggered start and finish time, if we have a staggered working from home, some working from the office, um, that can be achieved to maintain the physical distancing. The other thing is making sure, and I'll get it to the signage and posters, but making sure that the staff are um, aware that they still have to maintain physical distancing where possible within the workplace. So hand hygiene, uh, hand washing and uh, hygiene has been noted to be one of the most imperative Thing we can do in regards to COVID. So that consistent washing of hands, coming into contact, we must stress to ourselves and to our staff that they must maintain this within the workplace as they even should be from home. So providing of hand sanitizer for staff, uh, providing uh, of, of soap, um, that's mandatory, it needs to be done. Now, I've spoken with a number of organisations who can't source hand sanitizer. I understand that. It's, it's hard for anyone to um, obtain a lot of the PPE with everything that's going on at the moment, but we do need to, as the employer's responsibility, provide access to our staff um, so they can maintain good hand washing and hygiene. So we're going to be um, the role models uh, to our staff when it comes to uh, hand washing and hygiene. So consistently encouraging, reminding, uh, drilling into staff that hand washing and hygiene is imperative and it must be maintained. So the next step is signage and posters. So back to Safe Work Australia, their website has brilliant um, posters and stickers that can be printed off and put around the workplace to remind our staff of physical distancing, hand washing, hygiene, cleanliness, and also marking out specific areas of an organisation. So if you've got a reception desk, you have the 1.5 metres from uh, if someone comes to reception and uh, you know how far can they go so we're taping it out we're marking it out to our staff members of where they can and can't go um, to maintain that physical distancing and just general information about maintaining hygiene and cleanliness 
which brings me to the next point of cleaning. So the Australian government does have some guidelines in regards to how a workplace should conduct their cleaning. So they've targeted down on your frequently touched services that would require regular and systematic cleaning. So these are things such as door handles, uh, tabletops, uh, elevator uh, buttons, switches, anything where during the day we're going to come into common contact with. So a door handle, if you've got a common entrance and exit, uh, that needs to be cleaned um, regularly throughout the day. So whether it's your less minimally touched surfaces, such as your floors um, and walls and, and, and general areas that uh, are not a high point, high contact touch area, they still need to be cleaned uh, daily. So the next step is self-isolation. So staying at home uh, if you're unwell, long are the, gone are the days where you would be the hero and you would go to work when you're not feeling well because the work needs to be done. We need to advise our staff that if they have symptoms of COVID, they need to go and get tested. We can't necessarily direct that an employee must get tested, but we would be making sure that they're aware the importance of getting tested. And again, back to that state versus state requirements, there is so for testing as well. So there's also government requirements that can be issued for staff that uh, are required to stay home. So if they've been in direct contact with someone that has a confirmed case of coronavirus, or if they've frequented an area that has an outbreak, which we've seen um, in, in our capitals at the moment, or um, if they are in fact being tested, that they do stay home uh, whilst they're awaiting their results. Now, it's important to note that if we direct staff to go and get tested, it can be arguable that that employee shouldn't have to access their own uh, leave entitlements for that time if we're the ones giving the directive. So if we look at, um, different measures that we can put in place. So working from home where possible, vulnerable workers as maintained by the Australian government that they should be allowed to continue to work from home where possible. There has been some changes in regards to vulnerable employees and I'll get to that in, uh, shortly. And obviously noting that not every industry or job can be done from home. So maintaining physical distancing, hand high washing, hand hygiene, signage and posters, cleaning and self-isolation. So now we're on to our vulnerable employees. So this is generally uh, the, the lay when it comes to vulnerable and work, uh, workers. There has been updates by the Australian government recently to break it down even further. So now we have two uh, types of workers. And again, the information uh, is about, um, provided in the last slide. So we're talking about employees at a severe risk of implications of coronavirus and those who have a moderate risk. So the update for severe risk is anyone that is 70 and over and they've had an organ or they've had an organ transplant and are on immune suppressive therapy. If they've, if an employee has had a bone marrow transplant in the last 24 hours, um, if they're, uh, they're on immune suppressive uh, therapy, if the employee has had a blood cancer, so things like leukemia, lymphoma, they are treated to be a, a severe risk or if an employee is currently undergoing chemotherapy and radiotherapy. So those deemed to be a moderate risk, which is the ones that we mainly see or dealing with, with requests um, to work from home. Uh, those with uh, chronic uh, kidney failure, heart disease, uh, chronic lung disease, excluding mild or moderate asthma. Now that's important to note because we've seen a lot of employees um, who have 
provided organisations with uh, a basic directive to continue to work from home because they have mild to moderate asthma. Now, the important thing is we're not medical practitioners, so we still need to take direction from the employee's health professional when it comes to if they're at risk. Um, but the government has updated that information to include asthma. Uh, it also includes a moderate risk to staff who have had cancer in the past 12 months, if they have diabetes, uh, chronic liver, liver disease, uh, some neurological conditions such as strokes or dementias, uh, and some chronic inflammatory conditions and treatments. So the list has been expanded, but the main risk are, are your top over the age of 70, had the organ transport plant, cancer um, or on radiotherapy. So, so support place, it's been uh, provided by the Australian government and again I'll say it that if they can work from home they should work from home if they're vulnerable. So returning an employee to a workplace that is deemed to be at risk, we must undertake a risk assessment of the employee. So with that, we need to look at the characteristics of the worker. Um, what do they do? What does their role require? Are they front facing? They have come into contact with any other traffic. Have we got people coming and going all the time, general public, those types of uh, risks need to be assessed and the nature of the work. So what, what is the employee doing? Are they providing direct care? Are they an admin assistant where they're away from it all? Um, and then from there, we'd be looking at uh, reassigning to other areas of work where possible, because obviously we want to mitigate the risk to the vulnerable employees at all times. So if we can't reduce the risk, then we need to look at the next stage. So if we've got an employee who, whose job cannot be done from home, we cannot properly remove the risk of that employee, then we would look at making alternative arrangements with this employee, such as asking if they would like to take leave. Um, but we can't, we need to be careful not to be seen to be directing uh, employees to take leave if they meet um, one of the uh, one of the lists of vulnerable people, just because you have an employee who's over the age of 70 uh, doesn't mean we have to exclude them straight away. So we want to get away from any form of questions of discrimination, barring a person who is fit from work, but we need to also protect our organisation by running risk assessments. So I'm going to get through to what a risk assessment would look like uh, within a workplace. They can be complex. There's a lot of lists um, and situations and scenarios you need to run through with an in-depth risk, risk assessment, which is important if we've got our health and safety reps in the workplace, they are trained to assist and to do our risk assessments. Now, if we're doing an individual risk assessment for an employee who is deemed to be vulnerable, we must maintain our confidentiality of this employee. So obviously we're not going to give the HSR rep um, a copy of their medical backgrounds that we've had to take to, to deem them to be a vulnerable employee. It would just be enough to provide that information that we do have a vulnerable employee um, and, and can we undertake the risk assessment. Now, if we don't have a health and safety rep within the workplace, we have to do the, um, the risk assessment ourselves. So this is what a risk assessment does look like. So we need to identify the hazard. Now, a hazard is generally an employee um, contracting COVID from either customers, clients or other staff who are infected with COVID-19. So then we assess the risk. So what is the harm? The employee contracts COVID. 
how serious is the harm? Obviously, if we've got an employee who is deemed to be a serious risk or serious risk of harm, um, then obviously the greater. So the likelihood of the um, harm occurring. So it's going to be increased if there's been a reported localised outbreak in a close proximity. Uh, and unfortunately to say in Victoria, th there's a risk anywhere between uh, Melbourne and the Sutherland Shire. Um, but if we're looking at a state such as WA, uh, the, you know, if we've had no localised outbreak, no community transmission, then the risk is low to that employee for being in the workplace, even if they are deemed to be serious or um, high risk. So what can we do then to mitigate our risk? So we then need to implement effective control um, of, of the risk. So that is taking steps such as um, cleaning, disinfecting, physical distancing, 1.5 metres, um, maintaining that, working from home where possible. With a risk assessment, obviously, we want to remove the risk altogether. So if there's a risk to the employee, the way to do that would be working from home. If that's not possible, we then have to look at moving them to another area where they're not going to come into contact with other people that we've identified to be that risk to the employee. So we then need to implement control measures, cleaning. It needs to be consistent, um, providing PPE to our staff that are required to work. Um, and then the last step is your review. So we're consistently keeping on top of our risk assessments. Has there been a local outbreak in the community? Have my employees come into direct contact with someone that has had coronavirus because of a community outbreak? Um, clusters, uh, different industries can have different specific requirements in regards to PPE and um, testing and the like. So we need to take that into account um, and whether our physical distancing is being maintained. So consistently reminding our staff that they must maintain physical distancing where it is possible, unless you're in an industry where you can't do that and you're deemed to be an essential service. And that that's generally in our disability support sector and our healthcare that we'll see. So it brings us to the last step, which is the most imperative when it comes to uh, returning back to work in a post-COVID era. I don't think in the near future we're going to have um, a situation where we're COVID free. So we're going to have to deal um, with, uh, with what we have, and that is returning staff to work um, in the current landscape. So when we're looking at employees who are now refusing to return to work, it has been a growing issue that we're addressing through workplace relations. So employees can't refuse an employee's uh, direction to perform work if that direction is reasonable and in line with the employer's legal obligations. So what that means is uh, some employees may be able to refuse to uh, return to work uh, because they have a reasonable concern when it comes to their health and safety and a risk to them being in the workplace. So the way I like to approach my return to work programs of employees in a post-COVID era is to have that one-on-one -on -one consultation with your staff. Advise them of the plans that you're looking at implementing. Contact them, ask for any feedback. What would they like to do? Uh, what concerns would they have about returning back to the workplace? But making sure we are being firm that the organisation is not going con to continue to run a, work a working from home um, process if that's the way the organisation is heading. So the board needs to come to that decision that we're going to return staff work, we're going to no longer have staff working from home, or we're going to have a hybrid system where some may want to still work from home, some still can work from the office, 
but what we need to ensure is that we are still addressing the concerns of our employees and looking after our vulnerable, um, vulnerable staff. So when you've got an employee who's now refusing um, to uh, undertake a directive that's given by an employer, um, that will ultimately lead to disciplinary action being taken uh, against the employee. So when we're looking at a disciplinary action in regards to COVID and refusal to return back to work, we need to be a little bit careful in the circumstances of which we're gonna go down a disciplinary action with them. So if you are looking at implementing a disciplinary action for someone who's refusing to return back to work, what I'm gonna suggest is to definitely get in contact with us in the workplace relations team and we can run through that with you because it is dependent on the facts of the reasons why the employee is re refusing to return back to work. And the reason why I say it is because if we go straight through to dismissing the employee, there may be protections available <clears throat> to that employee, such as a general protections so a general protections will arise um, where an employer uh, has taken adverse action against the employee because they have a workplace right or has exercised a workplace right. Um, so adverse action can be anything such as dismissal, uh, changing their job to their disadvantage uh, and terminating a staff because of a workplace right. So a workplace right, is anything uh, whereas an employee is entitled to the benefit because of a workplace law, has the role of a responsibility under a workplace law, uh, such as making a complaint of freedom of association. So how that rolls into is if you've got an employee who is a health and safety rep and is raising concerns about returning to work, we can't terminate them on the basis of them being a health and safety rep because they are protected under a workplace law to undertake that role. So always seek advice by us if we are looking at going down the road of termination. But ultimately, if we're giving a directive, the employee fails to comply with that directive, and they're still refusing to return back to work, then ultimately we can dismiss the employee, but we depend on the facts presented. So the other thing is to look at um, is obviously the safety of the employee. Obviously we're not gonna be directing an employee back to work that is vulnerable, but on the circumstances, we're having a lot of staff who are presenting with medical evidence that will say that um, my partner uh, is high risk. Um, I don't want to return back to work because if I contract COVID, then my partner is going to be at risk. But the duty of care does not extend to that point. The duty of care you need to give is directly to that employee. So we have had situations where they can get complex in regards to return to works. And the other thing we do need to look for is staff who are now becoming um, AWOL um, or abandonment of employment now because they've either been on leave without pay, we're not quite sure where our staff are, we wanna return them, they're not answering their phones. So if we're dealing with any form of directions, dismissals, anything along those lines, give us a call in the workplace relations team and we'll go through that um, prior to implementing any form of process with the employee. But ultimately, the general premise of it is that the employer does have the power to direct an employee back to the workplace where that workplace is free from any risk, harm or injury. Specifically, if an organisation is in receipt of JobKeeper, it makes it a lot easier for them to give the written directions, giving the three days notice to return back to the workplace. But again, they still need to take into account any form of occupational health and safety concerns that an employee uh, may have. 
So there's the links I've provided. So we've got the Australian Department um, of Health, and that's very important. And I need to advise that this information does consistently update. So make sure that we're checking the information because information you may check on there may not be there tomorrow. It may be strengthened, it may be weakened. Um, also, the Fair Work Ombudsman has fantastic information about COVID-19 in the workplace, about enforcements of leave and things like that. Um, then there's also the National COVID-19 uh, Commission planning tool for our COVID safe workplace. So that's really the government's guide on what the COVID safe workplace does look like. Safe Work Australia, that is a fantastic resource to grab any posters, checklists about um, COVID in the workplace. And of course we do have um, our Jobs Australia information on COVID that is available uh, to, to our members. So I, I think it looks as though we may have run out of time, but as I said, if there's any questions that you do have, give us a call on Workplace Relations at any time and we're happy to answer them. And if you have any questions that you've provided in the webinar, I'm more than happy to review them and get back to you at a later date. Thank you.